Aren't you glad that when we face the fires of life, that we do not face them, what, alone? That we have another uh, with us in that fire. And uh, praise God uh, for that. You know, the Bible doesn't guarantee that you won't have to face the fires, all right, in this life. But it does guarantee that if you know the Savior, that He is with you. And he will not forsake you, and he will not leave you. Let me ask you a question before we get into uh, the word this morning. Do you, all right, believe in the power of prayer? Do you believe that prayer makes a difference? All right, now answer that in your mind. Then I want to ask you this question, but don't answer it out loud, all right? How much time have you spent this week in prayer? All right, ask yourself that. See, I believe nothing is done outside the realm of prayer, uh, communion with Almighty God. I look at it this way, and I was in ministry for a lot of years. If my Lord and Savior, the Son of the living God, had to go constantly in prayer and communion with His Heavenly Father to accomplish His Father's will that He was sent to this earth to perform, how can little Bill, all right, Think, I'm going to serve God, I'm going to raise a family, I'm going to do all this, and I'll do it on my own, and if I have enough time, I will pray. We need to be people of prayer, all right? Now, I'm saying that because uh, you'll find somewhere near you a little uh, handout I put out, Potter's Hand Bible Church Prayer Fellowship. I had somebody call me this week and was uh, mentioning about a prayer request, and I'll mention several prayer requests in a second. And saying, would you activate, you know, the prayer chain? And I was thinking to myself, what prayer chain? <laughs> All right? Because, uh, again, it is uh, not up and active. The last time I tried to activate it, there really wasn't that many people that even signed up for it. All right? So um, it convicted me, as a church, we need to pray for one another. Wouldn't you agree on that? If you had a loved one that was in intensive care, would not you want to call a pastor of the church, and say, would you activate my family, my church family, that they would pray for my husband, for my wife, for my mom, my daughter? Absolutely, right? And so this is going to be your opportunity, all right? You'll notice here, all you got to do is put your, say you're committed to it, your cell phone, email. We will communicate with you. We're not giving this to anybody else. and not, We're not selling no list to anybody. But uh, end up that you would receive, uh, all right, an email or a text. And you would know, all right, again, a request that you would be able to pray for. So if you're willing to do that, make sure you fill that out. You can either put it in the uh, treasure boxes. You can leave it in the back as you leave. Uh, and, the, you know, the person that called me this week, all right, was Brenda Rose. Brenda, are you here this morning? Looking around, she's probably ruined. I see Don, all right. Don, is Kristen still in the ICU? All right. Um, Brenda called me about their daughter, uh, Kristen, and many of you know uh, their children attended uh, here at the church very frequently. She's in an intensive care unit over at Rex, all right, complication, serious complication of diabetes, and we need to remember Kristen in prayer, all right? So we want to definitely remember her. Also, we want to remember our brothers and sisters, all right, in the Ukraine. I don't know if you understand this, but the Ukraine has a very large, all right, Christian population, very thriving church. In fact, if I'm not right, there are either one, two, or three of the number of missionaries that are sent out in all Europe come from, guess where? Ukraine, all right? And you have people in subways, all right, praying, all right, for husbands who are out, in other words, uh, again, uh, in battle, all right, praying uh, with their children and everything else, Brothers and sisters in the Lord, and we need to be upholding them uh, in prayer, let alone with all the other needs, all right, within our families and in our church. So what I'm going to ask before we uh, get started in the message this morning, let's bow our heads and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you this morning that we can boldly approach the throne of grace to seek help, dear Lord, in our need. And we thank you that that approach, that access, was made possible by your son and his death on Calvary's cross. Dear Lord, we come and we acknowledge our weakness. 
But we acknowledge, dear Lord, your power and your glory. And we know that you can do all things. So this morning, I want to pray for Kristen as she's there in the hospital. I pray for your anointing in her life. Dear Lord, give the doctors wisdom. Dear Lord, as they treat, dear Lord, uh, her symptoms and what's going on in her body. I pray, dear Lord, that you would touch Kristen's body and that you would restore her to health. Dear Lord, comfort her family. Dear Lord, her children. Dear Lord, um, Brenda, Don, and other members of the family, just be with them. Also, we want to lift up this morning why we're here, dear Lord, in this place, enjoying the freedoms of the country in which we dwell. Dear Lord, we pray for brothers, sisters, dear Lord, in the Ukraine. Dear Lord, that um, really with a future with big question mark, dear Lord, and uh, looking to you, I pray that you would strengthen them. I pray, dear Lord, we just got done singing about you, the one who is with us in the fire. In the midst of that fire, in the midst of those tears and death and pain and agony, that you would be there. And that you would give the peace and comfort, dear Lord, and assurance that you only can give. So I pray, dear Lord, for that. Then I pray, dear Lord, as we meet together today, dear Lord, that you anoint your word. May it find a lodging uh, place in our hearts, for I pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Now, just a second. In fact, we're going to be in the book of Acts this morning. And in fact, what I'm going to do, I, I, I had mentioned before when I spoke that I, I read a lot of devotional books. And especially, I like to read uh, biographies or autobiographies of fellow believers or Christians. All right? Uh, it encourages me. When I read about the battles that they face, and then, you know, you get in situations in your own life that can encourage us in living out the faith. Uh, Diane had got me for Christmas uh, this devotional book that I asked her from The Voice of the Martyrs. Some of you might be familiar with that ministry. And it's devotionals, all right? These are true devotionals, right? Whether they're letters, whether they're stories of believers who really... Paid for their faith, all right, with their lives being tortured and so forth. And um, I had read the other day, um, this was a devotional by Sabrina Wormbrand. That's the wife of the gentleman who started, all right, that ministry. And they're uh, Romanian, uh, Jewish people. And what had happened, living in Romania, after World War II, when the Nazis were forced out of Romania, the communists came in, Russia came in, all right? And, of course, first thing they wanted to do was get rid of all what? Religion, all right, all belief in God. And um, they assembled, all right, this is history, all right, all the church leaders, whether you were, you know, Baptist, Lutheran, or whatever, and they're going to have a big congress, and um, they made sure, you know, you understand uh, that you were going to all be behind at that time the leader was Stalin, all right, and you're going to extol, in other words, uh, his leadership, and you're going to fall right in line. And anyhow, they, uh, his wife was writing, they sat in the Romanian National Congress on religion shortly after the communist soldiers had stormed the country. They assembled all the Christian pastors, priests, ministers of all denominations, and they were called, and they stood one by one and spouted praise to Joseph Stalin and to the new communist leadership uh, who had just put thousands of Christians all right, in the prison. All right, the wife, and I associate with this, many times it's the wife and I'm a man who was the stronger one in the faith and kind of pushes us as men along. Well, his wife, Sabrina, right, reached over and pinched Richard's arm. You got a picture of this, right? He's a pastor, large church. And she said, stand up and wash the shame from the face of Christ. They are spitting in his face. And, of course, Richard ends up, he answered and looking intently, all right, ends up saying, you know, if I do that, you're probably going to lose your husband, all right? I'm, I'm going to be gone. And she ends up saying, her eyes bore into his, I don't want a coward for a husband, all right? And it ends up, as Richard stood to speak, many were thrilled, all right? Well-known pastor would join their cause, but instead of praising the communist, he praised Jesus Christ as the only path to salvation. He said, a first loyalty should be to God, not communist leaders. The gathering was being broadcast all over Romania. So all of a sudden what they intended, all right, was being subverted. And thousands across the country heard his challenge. Well, the story goes on what ended up happening. He spent 14 
years in prison, and I, it, it's not for the weak of heart if you would read what he went through, all right? And the reason I'm saying I read this devotion, I'm, I'm constantly asking myself, all right, I say I'm a Christian, all right? Then I read about these folks, and I said, man, I'm looking at their faith, and I'm trying to equate their faith with my faith, all right? Because I figure one day, you know, we're going to be in heaven together. Somebody might come up to me, you know, you know, how was, you, how was your Christian life? What did you do? What am I going to say? Well, it was cold in church today, right? <laughs> I had a chill, right? And these, I, I, I tell some people, I think I'm going to find a little corner in heaven, right? And just, just be glad I'm there, right? Because I haven't faced anything. I was reading this other devotion the other day, and this was from a young girl, all right? This was in, in Russia itself, all right? And she's writing this true letter, wrote, Dear Mom and Dad, in my last letter, I told you about atheist girl, Varia, and how I'm so happy to tell you the exciting news, Varia has received Christ, and she is so different and is already witnessing to everyone. When Varia first believed, she still felt guilty inside. I think she was unhappy because for so long she believed and made a point of telling others that there is no God. And she felt that she needed to suffer and pay for this. Well, we went together to the Assembly of the Godless, or the Communist Youth Organization meeting. And although I warned her to be reserved, it was useless. After refusing to join the singing of the Communist hymn, Varia went forward to address the whole assembly, and she courageously told everyone about accepting Christ as her Savior. She begged everyone to give up their way of sin, come to Christ, and the whole place went silent. When she finished speaking, she sang with her incredible voice the old hymn, I am not ashamed to proclaim the Christ who died to defend his commandments and the power of his cross. I could only watch as they helplessly took her away. Today is May 9th, and we haven't heard anything about her. Please pray, Mom and Dad. Like I said, I, I read those devotions each morning and challenge myself all right, concerning my faith. And so what I want to do this morning, I want to talk a little bit about what it means to be a Christian. We throw that name, you know, around a lot. And there's a lot of confusion, all right, on what it means to be a Christian. Many see, you know, Christianity as a broad tent. See, I remember this when I was a young man, all right, God called me into the ministry. I was a member of a certain uh, denomination. I'm not going to, you know, give them the names of the denomination or anything else, all right? And uh, I was um, really a manager of a financial institution, but I was going to be their lay pastor, all right? I knew the pastor. The pastor was leaving, and I took that position. And um, ends up that um, the church grew and God blessed, but I became, you know, associated with people's, people in their, all right, association. And I still remember going to my first pastor's association meeting, and I was talking to this guy, and he was explaining, he was a fellow pastor, that he didn't believe the Bible. Now, Bill was naive, all right, because I'm thinking in my brain, how can I be a pastor and not believe the Bible? In other words, what would I be preaching on Sunday morning, right? What would I, what would I be? I couldn't even understand. So Bill, in his, you know, being naive, all right, I think it was 19 years of age, I'm going to go and talk to the, the person who was in charge of the whole that was the Midwestern Association, four states. And I'm going to explain the situation that's going on. All right, you can picture this, right? I take a deacon with me, right? And I'm explaining, yeah, you don't know what's going on. Do you know that there is people, pastors in the churches that don't believe in the Bible and don't believe in Jesus, the virgin birth, and don't believe in the second birth. I was shut down. That all of a sudden, I was put on the defense. And he explained to me, you need to understand, Bill, that Christianity is a family. And we're a big family. Don't you have brothers and sisters who are totally different than you? Don't agree with you? Well, that's like the church. He believes the Bible. He doesn't believe the Bible. He believes the virgin birth. They don't believe. But we're all one happy family. Oh, what? <laughs> I'm trying. But you understand there are many that see Christianity like that. 
that we end up with, it's sort of like a smorgasbord. I'll take what I want to believe out of the Bible, and that makes me already a Christian. And it, it's amazing. I don't have time this morning. I was reading a recent survey. And, of course, you can understand. You can just see what's going on in our country. But you know what shocks me is how many people who call themselves evangelicals or Christians and what they believe. I was looking at some of these things, all right? One-third of the church today that would claim to be evangelicals, Christians, don't believe in the deity of Jesus. I mean, just think about One-third don't believe in the deity of Jesus, right? All right? Uh, 65%, all right, unbelievable. Maybe they don't understand what they were checking, all right? They believe that Jesus is the first and greatest created being of God. Wait a minute. God didn't create Jesus, all right? But uh, again, one out of three, all right, believe now that um, beliefs of, are a matter of personal opinion, not objective truth. There is no objective truth. You discover truth. And God bless you, your truth. You know. But we're talking people in the church, all right? 57% confused about, all right, salvation, there's increase in the church. The third, it's not really essential that you get together and believe. I mean, I mean, associate together and to worship together. In fact, Matt was told, finished the series, all right, dealing with sexuality. Do you realize that 22% of evangelicals believe, all right, or reject the Bible's teaching that gender is male and female? One out of five people who say they're Christians. And you look at this and you're going, it's hard for me. You know, with so, what I thought I would do today is look, what is a biblical meaning, all right, of being a Christian? And if you realize, I want you to realize there's only three times in your Bible where the word Christian can be found, all right? Only three times. And each time the word Christian is used, there is a key word or key idea that is associated with us. And so, what I thought, if we're going to understand what a Christian is, let's look in the context of the Word of God, and we're going to look at three words associated with that term to get a clear understanding. So I want you to go to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 26, verse 28, all right? First time this word, all right, one of the first times this word is used. 26, you find these, all right, words, verse, uh, verse 28. Then Agrippa, who was the king of Judea, all right, says to Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. You almost persuade me to be a Christian. Key word there is what? Persuade. Almost persuade me. So evidently to be a Christian, what is involved? Persuasion. That I'm persuaded of certain truths. Now, the Apostle Paul, get the background, has been a political prisoner for over two years. He has appealed to Caesar, all right, that he might receive justice. He was a Roman citizen, so he's going to be on his way to Rome. But before leaving for Rome, he is brought before King Agrippa, who was the king of Judea, Herod Agrippa, and he was visiting the governor, all right, Festus, and instead of begging for his life, I love the Apostle Paul, all right, what does Paul do? He preaches, right? Man, he's going to preach. He's going to testify. Governor, all right, uh, his conversion. He's giving them his what? His testimony, right? That he's witnessing to them. And King Agrippa is coming under conviction, all right, as he's leave like you. Now, you notice if you read, all right, this chapter of how close Agrippa came. Because he knew about Jesus. In fact, in verse 26, Paul ends up uh, saying this, For the king before whom I also freely speak, you know these things. All right? You know about Jesus. In fact, the things Paul witnessed to were the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's telling the king, all right, you know what I am saying. You know about this. You know about Jesus. But here's the truth. 
knowing about Jesus doesn't make you a Christian. I still remember, again, as a young boy, I was in the Catholic faith. Man, I went through catechism. Man, I could spout everything about Jesus, right? Knew the prayer, but I didn't know him. I wasn't a Christian, all right? And, and I, but I knew about Jesus. I could give you, a, I could tell you that he died on the cross. I could talk about, you know, his resurrection, but I did not know him. So King Agrippa, he knew about Jesus. But not only did he know about Jesus, but in verse 27, he says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. What he's saying, I know you're acquainted with what the prophets of Israel wrote and preached. By the way, that's Old Testament books of the what? The Bible. So you're talking about you're a king, and he knows the Bible. He was a Bible student. He knew the words of the prophets concerning the Messiah. Um, it's just like, you know, you can be in the pew of a church or sitting in a church and think because you give, you know, Jesus lip service or the Bible lip service, that means you're a Christian. No. In fact, um, you know, I, I've been in a lot of different schools, colleges, degrees. I have some of the professors that I had, all right, in secular schools knew the Bible better than Christians that I know know the Bible, right? Didn't believe in it, thought it was literature, but they could quote it. They could quote you verses, all right? So he knew about Jesus. He knew the Bible, but he wasn't persuaded. And I'm going to give you three things, all right, that to be a Christian, you got to be fully persuaded of, all right? There is no leeway in these. Number one, you need to be fully persuaded of your sinful nature. You need to be fully persuaded, all right, no doubts, that you are a sinner. Now, you know, of course, me, like Diane says, that I live in my bubble, I would end up saying, everybody knows that. No, 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 no. Not everybody knows that. Not everybody admits that. They might say, well, you know, I've done wrong at times, but they're not persuaded that they are a sinner. See, not only do I sin, but it's my nature to sin. I am bent that way, all right? I mean, it's just that's my inclination, all right? And I need to admit, see, there's a difference. One must admit something is wrong on the inside, all right? My heart is wicked. And until one is fully persuaded of this, how do you need a Savior, right? If, I, if there's nothing wrong with me, why do I need somebody to save me? Came across this. And um, when I was looking, you know, trying to something to, you know, convey how some would end up believing this young couple, all right, uh, uh, Jay and Lauren, I'll just give their first names, to quit their jobs. They were going to take a year-long bike trip around the world. Uh, sadly, they ended up taking a fatal turn near the Afghan border where they were stabbed to death by ISIS terrorists. And the couple had ignored the warnings about the dangers of the region, claiming that evil was a believe that the whole world is a big, scary place. People, the narrative is a makeup concept. We've invented to deal with the complexity as abhorrent, then strive to understand this. Badness exists, sure, but even that's quite rare. By and large, humans are kind, self-interested sometimes, myopic sometimes, a kind, generous, wonderful people. No greater revelation from our journey than this. Man, kind of naive. Am I right? And I need to, if I'm going to be a Christian, I have to understand there's something wrong with Bill. All right? On the inside. That's why Isaiah says it this way in Isaiah 64, 6. But we all, as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness as those filthy rags. We're all sinners. I mean, we could sit here and we could compare each other. You know, well, I'm worse than you. You're worse than, I mean, my filthy rags of sin, you know, are more filthy than yours. But we're all what? Sinners. All right? This is what the verse says. It says that our sins are, and in fact, it doesn't even say our sins are as filthy rags. It says our what? Righteousness. Oh, wait a minute. All the good things we've done. If my good things are filthy rags, what is, what is my sin? Right? And this is the condition God says, all right? 
And uh, we, we don't like to, you know, admit that. But in order to be a Christian, I need to admit I am what? A sinner. It's like I think I used this illustration before. And this is going back a lot of years, but I, I, I can understand this. Company in England celebrating their 40th anniversary. They had this great idea. We're going to have a beauty pageant for all women over 40. But guess what? No women showed up because no women, as a true, no women were going to admit that they were what? Over 40. All right? Hey, I can understand that. And it's hard to admit that something is wrong. But I need to be persuaded to be a Christian. I'm a sinner. I am undone. All right? Even the best day of Bill's life compared to the righteousness of my God. Fully persuaded that Christ, the eternal Son of God, died for my sins. I know, again, this is elementary, all right? That Jesus died for my sins. By the way, that's the deepest truth of the Word of God. That Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, came and died for you and I, for our sins. 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation that Jesus Christ came in the world to save sinners. Who am I? Sinner. Came in the world to save me. Romans 5.8, but God commended his love towards us in why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 2 Corinthians 5.2, for he hath made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, the question we have to ask, have I ever allowed Jesus to take my sins that I might take his righteousness? Have I admitted that I am a sinner? I see myself as a sinner undone in need of a Savior. And I understand that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, came to this earth to die on the cross for my sins. All right? Have, have I ever seen that and understand that? All right? To be a Christian, I have to be fully persuaded of that. In fact, I, I was looking at this one verse in 2 John, verse 9. It said, whoever does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Whoever does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, does not believe right about Christ, doesn't even have God. I still remember I was a pastor of church up in New Jersey, outside New York. Back then, the Moonies were, you know, big. If you ever came in contact with them in the airport and everything, well, I had two missionaries from their church, Unification Church, that were signed to our church, all right, right after they had that big mass wedding over in uh, the stadium up there. 10,000 couples got married. Imagine getting married. You never even met your wife. Uh, the, the pastor just matched them up, all right? Well, I had a couple in my church. In fact, he was uh, from Japan, and she was uh, Jewish from Iran, all right? Picture this. And they had a son. And so they were there to, you know, as missionaries to our church, to help me see the light and understand that they also were fellow believers. And I still remember, and they were the greatest people. He, uh, they, they had this business of imports, these beautiful crystal figurines. He gave me nice gifts and everything else. And, all the, and I'd be there preaching. You know what he'd be doing? Amen. He'd be the one amening, all right? And back then it was a conservative, you know, Baptist church. Nobody's amening, but I got a Mooney. Amen to me as I'm preaching the Word of God. And all the people now are starting to, man, this is a great couple. And I'm going, there's something wrong here. <laughs> I better deal with this. And I still remember taking them to my office. And you know what? I'd start talking about what do you believe about Jesus? All right? Do you believe he's the Son of God? That he came to this earth, died for our sins. And that salvation is through him and through him alone. Of course, they believe their leader was uh, Christ himself who's come back the second time. And uh, they eventually left the church. But I'm saying, to be a Christian, he was, they're in the church. They're amening. They're giving their money, all right, to the church. They're nicest people you would ever meet, right? But they weren't Christians because they did not abide in the doctrine of Christ. So I'm saying to be a Christian, I've got to be fully persuaded that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, came to this earth, not to be a teacher, all right? He teaches me a lot of things. Not to be my example, and he is my example, but he came for the purpose to die for my sins. That was my biggest need, all right? Biggest need was the Savior. Third thing I need to be fully persuaded of, that you receive Christ by faith, not by works. Faith, not by works. No human work 
helps in salvation. It's the blood of Jesus alone. There's, again, a song, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's all of grace. Again, my background was a Catholic church. Man, you, you never knew where you go to heaven. I would ask the priest, do you know you're going to go? No, nobody knows. You just try as hard as you can and you hope. And when you end up in purgatory, you hope people are going to pray for you to get you out of purgatory. All right? And, and so, can I say this? You can be a pastor of a church. You can, you can do whatever you want to do, all right, for the cause of Christ. But unless you put your faith and trust in him, you're not saved. It is not by works. You can't do enough works. It's like I came across this uh, great analogy, all right, related to surgery. Say I know I need life-saving surgery, all right? I read up on it. I realize, hey, if I don't get this surgery, I'm not, I'm not going to be here Christmas with the kids, right? And i got to come to understand that there's nothing I can do to fix it. There's no, I can't go down to CVS, all right, and get you know, a certain concoction of vitamins, and all of a sudden it's going to cure it, all right? I can't remedy the situation. I can't, going to the gym is not going to help it or anything like that. And so to have the surgery, i got to let go of all my efforts. i got to put my trust in doctors. i got to lay down on an operating table, right? Relinquish full control over my body. And I must let go of my efforts and see this as the only way. Well, that's what saving faith is, isn't it? There's nothing I can do. There's not, I mean, I've had some good days. They don't outweigh the bad days, but, but it doesn't, I can't do enough. A Christian is one that understands it's not by works, it is by faith. So what is a Christian? Convinced he's a sinner. Paul was, right? He never believed that until he was knocked off his uh, mount there on the Damascus Road. He saw Jesus as the one who came as the Messiah, died for his sins, and he received Christ by faith alone. So we're saying Christianity is a person who's fully persuaded. I might not know everything about the Bible, but I know the Bible should. I'm a sinner, and I understand that. I understand Christ is my Savior, and I understand that it's by faith. It is not by works. Can I say this morning, I am glad it's by faith, or else I'd be totally undone, all right? Let me give you the second verse that you find the word Christian. It's in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. This is right before Paul got saved. It's the beginning, all right, of his Christian life. It says, Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. All right, and we know it's Paul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So he was there for a whole year. They assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called what in Antioch? Christians. All right, now what's the word you would put here? I'm going to use the word performance. People of Antioch saw this group, a new faith, and they saw how they lived, how they acted, and by the way they lived... They called them Christians because they reminded them of the Christ who they followed. See, you understand today what we would end up doing. Uh, if we were meeting, we are going to start a new faith. I gave everybody a piece of paper. I want your idea. What would be a good name? What would be a good logo, all right, that we're going to call ourselves? But you understand uh, Barnabas and the early believers, they didn't uh, have name that movement, right, and try to find a name. They were called Christians by the people that observed him. See, Christians are not just nice people. Christians are a new creation. It's like I, I have to go up to New Jersey. One of my close friends passed away, and I got to conduct a service uh, for him, Ken. And um, God bless him. You would not want to know him when he was young. He was one of those guys you would not want to meet, all right, in the dark. But I always realize that we just cannot believe, all right, who he is now. In other words, we can't equate Ken when he was a teenager and his 20s and 30s 
and Ken now. Something happened to this guy, right? I mean, he was this motorcycle. He was like Easy Rider, if you want to go back. That's who he was, all right? And, and the, but that's what Christians are. We're new creations. That's why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. See, Jesus didn't come to teach us a better way of life. He came that we might have life, and he is that life. All right? And we are here not only to believe the gospel, but guess what? I'm here also left in this world to behave the gospel, right? To live it out. I'm to live the Christian life. Herein is our love made perfect, John writes, 1 John 4, 17, that we might have boldness in the day of judgment. Why? Because as he is, so are we in this world. Ooh, so again, it's come this idea that when people see us, it should remind them of Jesus. You're not operating the way the rest of the world operates. You're not thinking like the rest of the world thinks. You're not talking like the rest of the world talks. I, I was going to give you, I don't, I'm not going to have enough time to get practical. All right, what does that mean? I put down, his joy is to be our joy. All right? Now, you can be facing all the fires we just sung about, but you still can have joy. Because John 15, 11, and by the way, this verse comes in the midst of the night. Jesus is going to be betrayed by one of those closest to him going to face an agonizing death. And he ends up saying to these men, these things have I spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that my joy might be full. Wait, 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 wait a minute here. You're starting, you're, you know, commemorating, instituting Last Supper. You're telling them your body's going to be broken, your blood's going to be shed, and you're told, I'm going to give you my same joy. Wait, 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 wait. Am I right? What is that joy? You know what that joy is, all right? That joy was accomplishing the Father's will. See, I'm not here to make a name for myself. I'm not here, you know, to make money. I'm not here, you know, to, to end up accomplish these great deeds. I'm here to accomplish the will of my Creator, the one who created me and the one who gave me life. That's why I'm here. And if I don't accomplish that will, my life is a failure. I can have an eight-figure bank account. I can have my name on as many doors as you want to have it on. But when I meet my God, it doesn't matter. I failed. So his joy is to be my joy. So even amidst the persecution, I can praise him and trust his sorrow is to be my sorrow. Paul talked about fellowship of sufferings in Philippians 3.10. He says that I would be in the fellowship of his sufferings. You know what? I think about it. Do the things that break... Your heart, are they the same things that broke the heart of Jesus? Jesus cried. Remember when he cried? At least I know two times he cried. One was at the grave of Lazarus, right? And the other was when? We're coming up to it. Palms, what we call Palm Sunday. When he rode down into Jerusalem and he sat over the city and he cried over Jerusalem. Why did he cry over Jerusalem? Because he was presenting himself on Palm Sunday as the lamb, spotless lamb of God to Israel as their Messiah, and they rejected him. And he was crying because what the future laid for those who have rejected him. Do the people that around you that you know that don't know him, does that break your heart and cause you to go to prayer, to pray for them? Uh, do the things that you see, see, it's so easy, and I was thinking about this. This world is broken, all right? I mean, you see people with gender identity, all this stuff that they were talking about. And it's easy to get my first, as a man, you know, my first, you know, emotion that comes to me, anger, right? But that wasn't Jesus. It was compassion. It broke his heart. This broken world that needs him. So I can ask myself, is this sorrow my sorrow? His friends, my friends. It says we know we pass from death to life because we love the brethren. Who are your closest friends? Now, we are to be friends to the unsaved. Understand that. That's the only way they could save. Jesus ate with publicans, did he not? With tax collectors. But my closest friends, to have somebody so close they know what makes my heart tick, they got to be a Christian. You, wouldn't un you could not understand me outside of my faith, right? And you got to ask yourself, is his friends our friends? 
Do you realize it was after his resurrection that Jesus called those men his brethren and that we are his brothers, and we're brothers of one another? How about his purpose is to be our purpose? All right, John 20, verse 21, after the resurrection, Jesus says, As my Father has sent me, even so I send you. The Father sent Jesus to do what? To come to this earth, all right, to redeem mankind. You know why we have been left here to be a witness for him? How could I call myself a Christian if I'm not interested in the salvation of souls? I mean, think about it. And then his way of life is to be my way of life. But again, a performance. In other words, to be a Christian, you, see, I, I, you would have these people that uh, came, well, I'm a Christian, but nothing's changed in their life. Well, it doesn't add up to what the Word of God says. It doesn't mean you become perfect. But, oh, world, I, Bill, I'm not holding that up, right? There's things I don't want you to know about, Bill. I made a lot of mistakes. But I am different than the man I was, all right? I'm not the man I should be, but praise God, I'm not the man I was. And one day I'll be conformed to the image, all right, of his son. Let me give you the last one, and we're out of time. Anyhow, First Peter chapter 4, and I'll equate this with what's going on today. First Peter chapter 4, verse 16, last time the word Christian used. It says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God in this way. Key word there is persecution or suffering. Being a Christian involves suffering. Woo. See, this is contrary to American Christianity, all right? Because we're thinking to be a Christian. I remember I was going to say, that everything's going to be wonderful. I mean, the sky's blue, the birds are singing, no problems in my life. I've always got money in my wallet. I'm always going to be healthy. But then I started reading the Bible. Ooh, wait a minute. Some of the people who followed God the closest suffered greatly. See, Peter warned the early Christians, you're going to have tough days. 1 Peter 4.12, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened. Sometimes we get this idea in America that God keeps me from all suffering. Can I say this? God has only one son without sin, I heard this saying, but he has no sons without suffering, all right? We're all going to suffer. Now, I want you to understand, here's where we get, you know, confused on this thing, because Christ warned us of this. In John 15, again, the night he was going to betray, he says, in the world, the world's going to hate you. You know it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. All right? Now understand, suffering as a Christian does not mean, oh, I got COVID. I'm suffering. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about as I live for Christ, all right, and stand for his truth, I am paying the price because of that. All right? It's not that I get a cold or I have bad knees or whatever. That's not what he's talking about there, all right? He's talking about guaranteed if you live all right, a life that resembles your Savior in a world that does not know him, you're going to attract attention and you are going to suffer. Just mark it down, all right? Read history. See what's going on in the world today, all right? So he says to be a Christian, ask yourself this. What have you suffered for Christ? You say, we can't. Well, my church was cold, right? <laughs> or what? what have you suffered for Christ? Like I said, I, I'm reading these stories and I'm, I'm embarrassed, to be honest. Then I ask myself, in fact, one of the quotes by one of them was this. You don't believe anything that you're not willing to die for. I mean, you kind of, you know, it kind of strikes you. I have to, don't give me some leeway, right? And I'm going, what do I believe in? I'm die for. See, and we're we're going to come to that place in our nation. I really believe that. All right, the reality of it. What do you believe? All right. But praise God that Christ gives that word of encouragement. He ends up saying to the men that night, 
These things have I spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you're going to have tribulation and suffering. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Peace in the midst of suffering. You know, I read that first letter by that young girl that got saved. Let me read the second letter, all right? That what was the girl that her girlfriend got saved, all right? This is from Maria, lived in Russia. It says, yesterday, Mom and Dad, August 2nd, I was able to speak to Varia. Varia was the girl that got saved, all right? She was thin and pale, but her eyes were shiny with the peace of God and unearthly joy. My heart bleeds when I think about her. She's only 19. As a believer, she's a spiritual babe, but she loves the Lord with all of her heart and chose to take the most difficult road right away. Please pray for her. They have taken all of her things away except the clothes she's wearing. We have taken up collections, send her packages. She doesn't receive any of them. When I asked, here's the thing. When I asked Faria if she regretted what she did, she said this, and I quote now. No, and if they free me, I would do it again. Don't think that I suffer. I am glad that God loves me so much and gives me the joy to endure for his name. And then the letter goes on to thank God that we have the peace to understand this. If we are in Christ, no sufferings, no frustrations should stop us. I can only pray, this girl was writing, that my faith would be as strong as Varia's if I was in her place. We now believe that Varia will be sent to the labor camp in Siberia, and the letter goes on. But I'm going, whew, peace. Well, isn't that what Christ promised. He says, right? In the midst of persecution, I will give you peace. So I was looking at this, and I'm saying, man, what is a Christian? One fully persuaded of his sinnership, Christ died for his sins, and you received by Christ alone. One who is a new creation, all right, performance, and one who is acquainted with persecution. I got to ask myself, man, am I fully committed to him? In fact, it comes down to this when I was thinking about all this. If Christianity is worth anything, it's worth my total 100% commitment. It's worth my life. And I'm saying this world needs to see the genuine article uh, like it never did. All right? And so may we pray for one another. May we be bold in our faith. And if there's anyone here today that you've never accepted Jesus Christ, whether listening or whether no, in other words, I just pray that you would come to that point, that you would put your faith and trust in him. Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. So our practice at the end of the service, we have an invitation. So this morning, we're going to have this invitation. Now, maybe you're here this morning, and you're not a Christian. You never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We would invite you to come at this altar. You can bow before your God. And if you admit that you're a sinner... And that you would put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ that he died for your sin. The word of God says that you will pass from death to life. Maybe you're here and you're not living the life that you should be living. In fact, by how you're living, you're bringing really repute on his name. Maybe you need to confess sin. Maybe you need to pray for a lost loved one. People who are co-workers that God would use your testimony that they would be saved. But whatever it is. We invite you to come to this altar. I want everyone standing, heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. If God has dealt with you this morning, whatever he has dealt with you upon your heart, we invite you to come.